Welcome to unit for uh, welcome to unit 19, uh, section 5.4 in our textbook. We're in 19. We're going to actually look at some. We'll see some math things again, which may not be your most favorite thing. Uh, we'll take a look at it. It may look a little bit scary at first, but if you look at the examples carefully, you'll see there's a pattern to them. If you work through some of the self-assessments in a textbook, that will help you out. And if you look at the self-assessments in the course, in the Blackboard part of the course, that should help out as well. You should read section 5.4 prior to doing this slideshow. So in Unit 19, we're going to look at calculations involving the mole. Back in Unit 18, we introduced the concept of the mole. We'll look at that again, kind of get, make sure we understand what that says. And we're going to actually start using that idea now to look at things that happen in the course of a chemical reaction. This goes back, harks all the way back to the early units that we did, where we looked at units of conversion, measurements, that sort of thing, and we looked at something called the conversion factor approach. If you remember, in the conversion factor approach, it was really kind of a three-step thought process we, we looked at. One is that if we take and multiply any quantity by the number 1, it returns the same quantity. You remember that from math, right? If you take 15 times 1, you get 15. If you take uh, 28 times 1, you get 28. Nothing very exciting about that, and it sure seems like life could not be complicated if you're just dealing with that. But let's take a look now at what happens when we start working in terms of units. And in this case, instead of measurement units like we saw it before, we're going to look at it in terms of grams, moles, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> the other thing about this unit 1 is that, that a factor, any factor in which the numerator is equal to the denominator, <clears throat> is equal to 1. So certainly if I have 5 over 5, that's equal to 1. If I have 12 over 12, that's equal to 1. If I have 18 over 18, that's equal to 1. So I could multiply any quantity by 18 over 18 and still get the same thing back. The catch here as we do it in science is that the numbers are not pure numbers. and Numbers have units associated with them. So for example, one dozen eggs is the same thing as 12 eggs. So if I took 12 eggs and put it in the numerator, put it on top, divide it by one dozen eggs on the bottom, that is a, fa a value of 1. They're the same thing on the top and the bottom, and I can multiply any number by that, and all I would be doing would be changing the units on it, not changing the actual quantity that I've measured out. So the idea in the conversion of factor approach is we form these conversion factors <coughs> and then recognize that any starting measured quantity we have, we can multiply by as many conversion factors as we want to, to get that quantity shifted to a different type of unit without changing the amount of material that we're talking about. <clears throat> Think about a exim simple example <clears throat> down below. If we talk about converting 15 feet to yards, okay, so you can do this in your head. Go ahead and do it. Got it? Yep, pretty easy, isn't it? It's going to be five yards. But if I think about doing it more formally, here's what we do. We recognize that you, to do that, you had to know that one yard had in it three feet. One yard and three feet are the same thing. One yard and three feet can be used in a conversion factor, and you'll see them in there in like the second bullet. It says that one yard over three feet is the same thing as three feet over one yard, and they're both actually equal to one. So I could take any quantity I wanted to, and I could multiply it by that conversion factor and get back the same measured quantity just in a different unit. And so and what we can do is set up a calculation. We did this earlier, so it may, hopefully won't look at totally strange to you and say, looking at the problem, we want to convert 15 feet to yards. The thing we're wondering about is how many yards this is. That's what we want to know. So I start that string down below where it says calculation sets up as. I start that out, and I start out with the question mark on the yards because that's what we're looking for. Then I put in the 15 feet, the actual measured quantity in this problem up on top, and then what I do is say, okay, I'm going to multiply it by 1 using that conversion factor, and to do that, I recognize that I want my feet, oh, I'm sorry, I've got a couple arrows here I forgot about, there you go, that I want my feet to cancel out. So if I have my 15 feet up on top, then that means in the bottom of that conversion factor, I have to have the units of feet. And so I'll put my three feet down in the bottom, and then I look at the yards and recognize I want to come out in yards, so the yards goes on top, and all it tells me to do is take 15, times 1, divided by 1, and divided by 3, and it gives me 5 yards. Okay, So we always put that conversion factor in orientation so that the original unit, in this case feet, cancels out, leaving yards for the answer. Um, now, 
Let's look at some practice in this in terms of moles to mass and mass to mole conversions. This is a little bit different now. And you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, this is entirely entirely more difficult than yards and feet are. This is not entirely more difficult than yards and feet. It actually is the same sort of an approach. From unit 18, the previous unit, you know that you can identify one mole of material as having in it Avogadro's number of particles. That's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And the other way we can think about it is if I have a mole of material, or Avogadro's number of materials, the mass of that material in grams will be equal to whatever its formula mass is. Or the formula mass we got by adding up the atomic weights of everything that was in there. So the mole gives us kind of a nice linchpin. We can go back and forth and talk about measuring material in different ways by using the mole. So if I go down and look at the first statement here, and uh, what we'll see, if we think about ammonia. So I have one mole of ammonia. Uh, is Avogadro's number of ammonia molecules. That's going to be true. It's also, if you add up the atomic weights of nitrogen and three hydrogens from the periodic chart, nitrogen is 14, each hydrogen is 1, so you have a total of 17 <coughs> grams in one mole of ammonia. All those things represent the same amount of ammonia. I can use those in any combination I want to to form a conversion factor that will have a value of 1. I didn't mean to hit that yet. Anyway, uh, you may not know this, so I'm talking to you, I'm waving my hands, which is what I do in class, and so I accidentally hit my, my mouse. Anyway, um, so let's look at these three problems down below. Three different types of things we're trying to find, all using this sort of approach. And the first one says how many grams of ammonia are in 12 and a half moles of ammonia. Second is how many moles of ammonia are in 145 grams of ammonia. And the third one is how many ammonia molecules are in 35 grams of ammonia. Okay, and and so down below, I've put those arrows up, say, desired quantity, uh, given quantity, conversion factor. We have the same pattern in all three of these problems. Okay, the things in the blue boxes, that's what we're looking for. We're looking in the first one for grams of ammonia, second one is moles of ammonia, third one is ammonia molecules, number of ammonia molecules. And so what you'll notice is over on the right-hand side where those three black arrows are that have shown up, where it says question mark grams of ammonia, question mark moles of ammonia, and question mark molecules of ammonia, all of those are written out there because those are the quantity that we're looking for. So the next thing we do then is we write on the other side of the equal sign the amount that we're starting with in the problem, the amount we want to convert in this problem. That would be the 12 and a half moles, the 145 grams, or the 35 grams down below. That's what we want to convert. And so what we do now is what we've once we've decided that, we decide what goes in the bottom of the conversion factor. And that's pretty easy to tell because it has to cancel that unit that we're starting with. So in the top one, I had moles of ammonia on top. I need to have moles of ammonia on the bottom. And the other, in the second one, I have grams of ammonia on top. I need to have grams of ammonia on the bottom. And in the third one, I have grams of ammonia on top. I have to have grams of ammonia on the bottom. And how do I decide what I put in the top of that conversion factor, the top of that last factor? I decide that by what it is I'm looking for. And so when you see that, <coughs> we see in the first one we're looking for gra <coughs> grams of ammonia. So grams of ammonia are on top. We're looking in the second one for moles of ammonia, so moles of ammonia are on the top. And the third one we're looking for molecules of ammonia, so molecules of ammonia are on the top. It's a pattern. Okay? And that conversion factor, that third thing, is there in every one of those units, top and bottom, is equal to the same amount of ammonia. 17 grams and one mole, same amount of ammonia. Avogadro's number of ammonia molecules in 17 grams, same as one mole, uh, same, same quantity of ammonia. And so I can carry out those calculations in pretty much the same way all the way through, and all I'm doing really is kind of swapping out who's on the bottom and who's on the top. But I have to go back and recognize that the mole is my, that's my connecting point. Once I know about a mole, I know that a mole has 17 grams in this case, a mole has Avogadro's number of molecules in the case, I know those things. So, so what? I mean, so if you can sit all day and you can calculate how many moles and molecules, who cares about that? Uh, what value is that? Well, it turns out the moles and molecules actually carry across the chemical equation which may not be something you wanted to hear. But if you decided that you've developed a whole new chemical process and you want to go make some money on it, you have to understand the relationships between how much stuff do I start with and how much stuff do I have in the end. So let's take a look at it in this case. Um, I don't know why that blue arrow is down there. I think I must have forgot to animate it. Anyway, 
The equation here is, this is propane up on top. C3H8 is propane, like if you go out and your propane grill, your propane bottles you have, this is what you're doing. You're doing a combustion reaction. So what that balanced chemical equation tells you is that one mole of propane, one mole of C3H8, reacts with five moles of oxygen to produce three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water. Okay? That's what those coefficients tell you. That's why the balancing is so important to us in these equations. Now, suppose that the question is asked, how many grams of carbon dioxide could be produced from 50 grams of propane if we have an excess of oxygen? Okay, that means when it says an excess of oxygen, it means we have plenty of oxygen. We're doing this outside in the yard or something like that. So as much oxygen as we need is going to be there. We don't have to worry about it somehow limiting how much this reaction is going to go. So all we're going to worry about is if I burn up this much propane, how many grams of carbon dioxide do I make? Okay, well, if I look at the first arrow, not the one that was there already, if I look at the first one that just showed up, it points out that the mass of carbon dioxide produced will be dependent on how many grams of C3H8 we have, because we have plenty of oxygen. Okay, we don't care about the oxygen. We have plenty of that to work with. Second arrow tells me that the coefficients, I just read this to you, is the coefficients give you the mole relationships. One mole of C3H8 reacts with five moles of oxygen to give you three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water. Before you get into ugly numbers, just think for a minute, if that's true, if I doubled those all up, that's still going to be true. Two moles of C3H8 will react with ten moles of oxygen to produce six moles of carbon dioxide and eight moles of water. I can double them up, cut them in half, cut them in tenth, do whatever I want to. As long as I keep that ratio, I'm okay. And then if I look at, and that's the one that was backwards, if the relationships uh, between the moles and mass are known through the molar masses, which they are, we can solve the problem. We know about the molar relationships, and then we know from the mole concept how many grams there are in a mole, so this should not be a big problem for us. So we look at the next slide. Before you do, just take a deep breath. It's not as bad as what it will look to be initially. Oh, arrow again. Okay. So I have this little table at the top. I kind of like this table because it helps me structure things so I can kind of think about them. And we're back to the question. The question is, how many grams of carbon dioxide can I make from 50 grams of propane? In that very top row, right there, I put my starting or my desired information. So what have I been given in this problem? What am I wanting to find in this problem? That's all up in the top row. We started with 50 grams of propane, so you see that written right above propane in that balanced equation. And then you'll see the question marked by the carbon dioxide because we're trying to figure out how much carbon dioxide we have. Notice there's nothing written above the equation for the oxygen or for the water because neither one of those is involved. <coughs> we aren't caring about how much went in or how much comes out. We don't care. So if I look at the information from the equation, here's what I see. In terms of coefficients, and I always like to write the coefficients, the mole coefficients out to help me recognize what the balanced equation tells me. It says that one mole of propane reacts with five moles of oxygen to make three moles of carbon dioxide and four moles of water. That's what it tells me. But you know also that we can think about moles in terms of grams. I don't have to always think about I can think about them in terms of grams. So if I take C3H8, and I add up what its molar mass is, and the molar mass is how many grams there are in one mole of the material, carbon has an atomic weight of 3, uh, sorry, of 12. There are 3 of them, so 3 times 12 is 36. And then I have 8 hydrogens on there, and each hydrogen has an atomic weight of 1. So I have 36 plus 8 is 44. So down below you see the 44 grams of propane. That corresponds to 1 mole. In the case of oxygen, I carried this through for your practice. So I look at the 5 moles of oxygen. Well, each mole of oxygen, the formula is O2. Oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, so 2 times 16 is 32. So when I think about 5 moles of it, it will have a mass of 5 times 32 grams. You can multiply that out if you want and get 160 and write it down there. That's fine. It doesn't matter. I like to keep the mole coefficients out for you so you always recognize where that 5 comes from. Notice we haven't changed how many grams there are in a mole of oxygen. There's still 32 grams in every mole. We just happen to be representing 5 moles here. And look at carbon dioxide, our, our other star in this whole thing. Molar mass is 44. Carbon is 12. Each oxygen is 16. And then there's water if you want to throw that in. <coughs> now, all that stuff in the gray shaded area represents the same amount of reaction. 
So in this reaction, if I talk about one mole of propane, that's the same thing as talking about 72 grams of water, 4 times 18. Okay, the same thing. Every Any pair of those things down below in that shaded area could be taken to form a conversion factor. Okay, so let me see what arrows I have. Oh, okay, there, up there, there we go. So let's see how we're going to do this. We're going to do just what we've been doing. It's a conversion of factor approach. It looks a lot uglier. I could have left off everything about oxygen, everything about water, because we didn't care. Um, but the idea is simply the same that we've been doing. What we're looking for is how many grams of carbon dioxide. Our starting amount is 50 grams of propane. And I put it over one so it looks like a nice fraction, so we can multiply by factors and have them all look pretty in the end. And then what we do is say, OK, if I do that, what has to go in next? Well, down at the bottom, You'll see that if I have grams of C3H8 on, as my starting amount, have that up on the top, then I have to have grams of three, C3H8 in the bottom. And since I want to come out in grams of carbon dioxide, I have to have grams of carbon dioxide in the top. And it tells me exactly what I have to do with those numbers down below the equation. And it tells me I can produce 150 grams from C3H8. Now, we haven't violated the conservation of mass at all because we didn't pay attention to the oxygen. It turns out we actually combined 100 grams of oxygen to do that. Okay. And we could have figured that out, too. So, so you can apply this. Now, by the way, you're not going to become worldwide experts at doing this. You need to get some sense about this is, this is important to us. And maybe do some simple ones to be able to figure out how much of this can I get from there. I know some of you are planning to go to Chem 1 after this. In Chem 1, you'll see a lot of this. We'll do a lot of this in Chem 1 with you. Um, <coughs> so we could have other things we wanted to ask about this and use the same approach. So somebody walks up and says, oh, that's great, but I don't care about the carbon dioxide. I want to know how many grams of oxygen will react with 75 grams of propane. Well, if you look at the conversion factor setup, what you're looking for, what you're trying to find is the grams of oxygen. Your starting amount is 75 grams of propane, C3H8. So your factor, your conversion factor, has the grams of propane in the bottom and has the grams of carbon dioxide in the top. And the numbers that go in front of those are the numbers from the shaded area in that equation above. And overall, we find out it'd be 273 grams of oxygen. Okay. Uh, let's see. The uh, next one is how many moles of water can I make? I do it with 350 grams of oxygen. I just take it. All I have to do is be swapping out what that conversion factor looks like. So for this, this one, I think this is the last slide. In this particular show, uh, unit 19, look at the self-assessments in the textbook, look at the self-assessments in Blackboard, and practice a little bit, and look at some of the problems at the end of the book, and just practice to get an idea for this. It's not as terrible and terrifying as what you think it is. It's really just applying things that we've already done.